that is not a believer in Christ, I pray, Lord, that without fail they would accept Jesus as the Lord of their life today and would confess it to the church. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we praise your holy name. Amen. When we first moved here in 2006, I um, <clears throat> developed several friends pretty quick. She's that way. She's kind of a social uh, butterfly, you might say. And she developed some friends. And one of her uh, friends' father uh, was a pilot on Delta. And he was about 15 years younger than me. Uh, and it seems that today that just about everybody I meet is 15 years younger than me or more. But anyhow, uh, he was a really healthy guy. He flew for Delta. And if you know what uh, those pilots have to go through, the commercial pilots, he flew internationally. And those uh, pilots have to undergo, you know, extreme rigorous physicals uh, and mental, et cetera, evaluations every single year. And we'd lived here about a year, <clears throat> and this man who was extremely healthy, big, vig vigorous, you know, strong, muscular, a pilot, you know, one of those guys that walks through the airport and turns heads, you know, like that. Sure enough, after about a year that we were here, he died suddenly of a heart attack. I mean, here's a guy, you know, just young in the prime of his life, and he dies with a heart attack that nobody knew about. As it turned out, he had a defect uh, that was a hereditary effect that nobody had told him about, and it was just in there waiting for the day just to come active. And on the day that it came active, it killed him nearly instantly. And with all of the medicals and all of the physicals and everything that had been done through the years with him as a military pilot and then as a commercial pilot, nobody had ever seen this defect. But nevertheless, even though no one had seen the defect, it killed him anyhow. I want to present a premise to you this morning. I don't know if any of you ever watch TV. Uh, but if you watch TV and you watch the news, everything's pretty depressing, amen? Pretty doggone depressing. I mean, I've lived a few years, and it's just about as depressing today as I've ever seen. There's all kinds of problems in the United States of America. There's all kinds of enemies that we face in the world. There's all kinds of things going on. And when I look at those things, and uh, when I look at those things, I think about this guy. And you know, on the surface, you know, America is big, America is strong, America is rich. I mean, we're the greatest nation on earth, and if you've never been anywhere, uh, I'll tell you, if you go anywhere in the world, you'll find out real quick that America is the greatest nation on this earth. And we appear that way to the rest of the world. But we got a defect. And the defect is, is that America has lost its heart. And we got heart problems. And what do I mean when I say that? Well, our, our country was founded on Judeo-Christian values. Uh, if you go to the, uh, the Senate, you know, in God we trust, Ten Commandments. If you go to the House of Representatives, in God we trust, Ten Commandments. You go to the Supreme Court, in God we trust, Ten Commandments. And that's on all of our federal buildings. Why is that? Because that was the basis for which our country was founded. And today what's happened is, is that because of the PC culture, because of trying to be fair with everyone that doesn't believe in the Judeo-Christian basic, the, because of different things, what happens, has happened is, is America's kind of lost its way, and America's kind of lost its heart. In other words, what made America great was that Judeo-Christian basic. If you look at all of our laws, all of our laws are based on the Bible. I mean, that's where they come from. All of our laws are based on the Bible. And so when you see, in, when, when you say in, uh, you know, in 1960 uh, that uh, the Bible can no longer be uh, uh, read in schools, when you say in 1962 that there can no longer be prayer in schools, uh, when you come back in 1980 and say that the Ten Commandments can't be on the walls in schools, when you come back in 1973 and, and tell the world that it's okay to abort babies, uh, when you come back in 2015 and you state that it's okay for uh, same-sex marriages, when, when, when our country does those kind of things officially, what it is, is in my estimation, and I, and I could be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong, it's a slap in the face to God. God made our country great. Amen? God blessed our nation. Amen? So the one who has blessed our nation is God. And when we do these things, our nation for about the last 50 years has been turning us back on God. And the result is, who is surprised by the result that we have today? The result we have today is our country is slowly but surely 
fallen into chaos. I mean, every single day you wonder what's going to happen today. Is that right or wrong? Every single day you wonder what in the world is going to happen today. Now, a lot of people think that if we just elect the right politician, well, that politician will solve all of our problems. And I don't, I don't care today if you're Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or the uh, uh, EPA Green Lady or I don't, you know, I don't care about any of those things. No politician or politicians are going to be able to solve the problem that we have in America because it's not a political problem. It is a what kind of problem? It is a problem of the heart. And the only one who can change the heart of a person, and the United States consists of persons, 300 and something million persons, the only one who can change the heart of persons is who? It's Jesus Christ. And so God is the only one that can solve our problem. Now before we're too tough on our culture, let's think about this. What is the heart of the American church? Now I can tell you the heart of churches in the countries I've been in, the, the heart of the church in Russia is pretty doggone good. Now, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, maybe not, but all of those independent churches in Russia, pretty good. They, they, they are focused on God. It's not easy to be a Christian there and not be a Russian Orthodox Christian, and, and it's pretty good. You go to uh, Tanzania with me, those, those Christians there, they don't have much in this world, but boy, they got Jesus, and they're happy about it. Amen? You go with me, Brazil, man, those guys right there, the, the Baptists there, and the non-denominational folks and everything, they are fired up about Jesus. So let's just talk about the heart of the Christian church in America. And let's just don't, let's just don't talk about, you know, the bigger part of the church in America. Let's talk about, well, we can talk about our church, but we could even go more than that. We could talk about our hearts. Is that right or wrong? Because ultimately, I'm only responsible to God for whose heart? My heart. Even though I'm a preacher, even though I preach the gospel, even though I'm supposed to preach the truth, ultimately, I'm only responsible for what's in my heart and where my heart is in relationship to Jesus. Over in the Bible, and I want us all to kind of take a, a kind of a mental test of where our hearts are today. In Matthew chapter 15, verse uh, 8, Jesus just said that people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So in your life today, what is your relationship with Jesus? Are you close to Jesus? Or is Jesus kind of arm's length? Or has it been a while since you communicated with Jesus? When we sang those worship songs a while ago that we all got into, uh, were we worshiping God with our heart? Or were we just, are we just worshiping God with our lips and with our mouth? What were we doing? See, worship is all from the heart. You know, you can't worship God if it's not coming from the heart. Otherwise, God sees it just as vanity. Over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, what does it mean to be pure in heart? Does it mean we don't commit any sin? Well, all of us commit sin every day, amen? If you commit sin every day, say amen. But pure in heart means that our heart is focused only on one thing. It's not focused on our job, although we have to do our job, we have to do it well. It's not focused on our driving, although we have to drive well. And we got these new cars that'll drive for you, so maybe we don't have to focus on that much anymore. It's not focused on our education. It's supposed to be focused upon Jesus. And then we go about our, our life doing all these other things, but our focus is upon Jesus. That's what Jesus says when he says the pure in heart. That means there's no double-mindedness. We're pure in heart. We have one thing that our heart is focused upon, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus says, over in John 7, 37 through 38, Jesus says, He that believes in me, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Let me ask you this, and I'll ask myself the same question. Are living waters filled with the glory and presence of God, are they flowing out of my heart because they're overflowing in my life. That's what it means. When something's outflowing from you, it means it's overflowing within you. So is the presence of Christ, the presence of his love, the presence of his spirit, is that overwhelming you? When's the last time you were overwhelmed by the presence of God? One of my sons, and I'm not going to say which one, 
<clears throat> but this same similar thing has happened to all three of them, and this, the third one has just happened to him. And you have to understand, some of you guys got kids, some of you guys got adult kids, and what we pray for our adult kids, if they're not living right, is number one, we pray that God will not hurt them too bad in the process of rescuing them. Who's, who's ever said that prayer? God, please don't hurt them too bad, just rescue them, amen? Yeah, God knows how to rescue the godly out of their temptations. That's what he did with me, and that's what he's now done with three of my sons. And uh, the son that this happened to last Sunday up in uh, Dakula, First Baptist Church, he came to me, Dad, and he says, Dad, I, 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 haven't, I haven't felt what I felt Sunday in a long time. I said, well, how did you feel? And he says, I was sitting there, and the Holy Spirit got hold of me so much, I just I started crying, and I didn't, I didn't even know what to do. And I said, well, uh, that's God speaking to you. He says, I know, and, I, and he says, I've been missing that. I needed that in my life. Well, that's overflowing and, 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 and flows of living water flowing out of his heart. And we sat there and we talked for three or four hours about uh, getting into Bible study and getting into a prayer life and, and uh, working on his family and being a good example to his wife and a good example to his son. And, and so we talked about that for a long time. And I could just tell he was just beaming. And I hadn't seen that happen in a long time. And that's happened now to all three of my sons. We're working on my daughter, but that's happened to all three of my sons. Okay, and uh, so <clears throat> Jesus says, or Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter three, Paul prayed that Christ would dwell in the hearts of all believers by faith, and that we would be rooted and grounded in love, so that we would know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, so that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Have you been filled with the fullness of God? Has that ever occurred in your life? I, I can't tell you how awesome it is when that occurs. I wish it would occur every day, but it does not occur every day, but it does occur. When we're the most focused upon God, sometimes in the midst of problems, sometimes not, when we're the most focused upon God, God shows up. And when God shows up, he fills us with his presence, and when he fills us with his presence, we are overcome with the fullness of God. I remember back in uh, 1990, well, a lot of you guys are here weren't born in 1990, but anyhow, uh, back in 90, <clears throat> I had just got invited to pastor my first church. And I told them no. I didn't want to be a pastor, I just wanted to be a preacher. So God had other plans. <clears throat> so the next morning in my Bible study, uh, Jesus showed up. How many of y'all been doing something and all of a sudden Jesus showed up? And Jesus showed up, and uh, I was just, first of all, I was just overwhelmed with his presence and overwhelming love. That's what happens, okay, because when Christ, Christ is love, and when he shows up, you're overwhelmed with his love. But then the next thing he said, <coughs> and, yeah, I mean, I, let's don't get into the audible thing or how, how, how I heard it or whatever, but I heard it, clear as crystal. Go on down there, I mean, in the church I just told I wouldn't be pastor of, it'll be okay, I'll be with you. Simple as that. And then for about the next, I don't know how long, hour or so, I just sat there and just, which I couldn't even hardly function. And that's the way it is. When we come into the presence of God and we experience the fullness of God, it just is beyond measure. And I went on down there, and I was a pastor there for three years, and caught holy heck all three years. But Jesus never abandoned me that whole time, and I learned a lot about being a pastor, what to do and what not to do in that three-year period of time. And I'm glad that I won. I look back on that experience now, and that was a really good experience. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21. Paul stated that a believer who is filled with the Spirit would sing and make melody in their heart to the Lord. My grandmother, who was a Pentecostal, I mean, she was the most devout Christian I have ever seen. No one could compare to the devoutness, devotedness and, uh, and her relationship with Jesus. I've never seen anyone like it in my entire life. And I've been around a lot of really powerful Christians. But I'm telling you that, when, and it wouldn't put on or anything else, when she'd walk around the house, she was constantly singing praise to Jesus, either singing a hymn or something she made up or, or singing in tongues. I mean, I, let's don't have the discussion about tongues today. But I'm just telling you, there was melody flowing from her heart up to Jesus. I mean, it was real. It was really there. And her life was very simple, but that was her life. Her life was her relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, first and foremost above everything, and the second was her family. But that's what it means. How long has it been since you just, uh, just all of a sudden just felt like just praising God? 
You know, a lot of times, maybe you're like me, maybe it happens on the interstate. Maybe you're just driving along, you got nothing else to do because you can't, you're not going anywhere. And all of a sudden, just, you know, Christian music's on, and all of a sudden, you just, not just because the music's on, but all of a sudden, you just want to praise God. It doesn't matter what's playing or anything else, whether you can sing or not. You just, you just want to praise God. Hebrews chapter 10 we read that one a while ago, verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure blood. You see, we cannot have a close relationship to God. We can't have our hearts filled with his presence. We can't have our lives filled with his fullness. We can't have rivers of living water flowing out of our hearts Okay, I mean, this is really unpopular today. If there's sin in our life. If there's sin in our lives, we're not going to experience God. If there's so much sin in our life that it's repetitive sin, we're really not going to experience God. And then what it takes to get back to God is some sort of revival event. It takes some sort of event to bring you back into the arms of God. Now, God will always do that. God knows how to rescue the godly out of their temptation, but it'll take some sort of event in order for that to happen. So if we have any kind of sin in our life today that is unconfessed, or if we have any sin in our life today that we have not repented of and turned away from, it will affect our heart and our, our heart's relationship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are we still saved? Absolutely, we're still saved but we're not going to feel close to Jesus. So maybe today, if you don't feel close to Jesus, if that's the situation you're in, then perhaps that's the problem. Maybe not. <clears throat> so question, what is, we need to all answer this before we walk out of here today, by the way, I think, or we need to meditate on it during the week. So what is the condition of my heart before God? Now you see, the only way that America's heart can be changed is by God. But the way God works in the world, he works through who? The church. And the church consists of believers. So in order for believers to impact their culture, in order for believers to impact the world, we have to be what? Our heart has to be right with God. You see, what I see in American, today in American churches is that the culture is impacting the church more than the church is impacting the culture. And that's why we have a problem. And the reason the church is not impacting the culture the way it should be is that we are not living power-filled lives. Why? Because our hearts are not right. Our hearts are double-minded. We've got all kinds of things going on and our hearts are not focused upon God. There's no power in our witness. There's no power in our testimony. There's no power in our word. There's no power in our life. Because the source of our powers as believers is the Holy Spirit of God welling up inside of us and the power of God overflowing like river, rivers of living water out of our lives. So consequently, the reason the church is not impacting America and the church is impacting the, and, the, and America is impacting the church is because there's no power in our testimony. And the only way that the church can have a powerful testimony is for God to get a hold of each one of us individually. I'll tell you what, if we had a true revival in here just with the number of people in this room, no more than what's in this room, if we had a true revival in our hearts this morning, it would impact our community. It would spread like wildfire. You wouldn't have to market it. You wouldn't have to put it on the internet. You wouldn't have to put it on Facebook. You wouldn't have to go door to door. It would just spread by the power of God. That's the way the power of God works. The power of God cannot be shut down. The power of God cannot be suppressed. The power of God cannot over, be overcome. Light will always overcome darkness, amen? But there's no power in our testimony. There's no power for the most part in most of our churches today. Even those that are big, even those that have a lot of people coming and, and a lot of things going on, this, that, and the other, they got programs, they got things, but ultimately there's just a lack of power in the church. And that comes down to each one of us individually. 
I want to have a power-filled Christian life, but I don't always have a power-filled Christian life. Why? Because sometimes I'm double-minded and I let my heart be focused where it doesn't need to be focused. So after I, after I wrote this sermon, I determined this week that every single moment of every single day, for, for a while, I'm going to focus on nothing about where my, where's my heart right now. No matter what I'm doing, with the 20 hours a day that I work or whatever, <coughs> what am I focused on right now? What am I focused on right now? We all need to be doing that. <coughs> and the more focused we become on Christ, and the more we feel his presence in our life, the more powerful our testimony will become to the world. Now, <coughs> so what can the church do in order for our problems in America our heart problem in America to be solved. Turn over if you would. You've probably, if you've ever been in a revival meeting in your life, who's ever been in a revival meeting? Okay. If you've been in a revival meeting in your life, more than likely, at some point in time, in that revival meeting, somebody brought up Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Now, God is primarily, in this passage of Scripture, God is primarily speaking to Solomon, and he's primarily speaking to Israel. He's not really necessarily talking to America. He's not necessarily talking to the church, except kind of by inference. But we can take this Scripture because it will apply to us now, since we are the wild olive branches uh, that have been grafted in. If you don't know what that is, go look at it in Romans chapter 10. We're the wild olive branches that have been grafted into the vine of Israel. So this does apply to us. And so this is a promise that God made to Solomon. And in verse 13, God says, If I shut up heaven that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts <coughs> to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, let's just stop right there. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. <coughs> When we have problems in our nation, when we have enemies that come against us, when we have internal strife, when we have all kinds of crazy things going on in the world, that's, that's a way that God uses. God allows those things to occur. And that's what God uses to bring a nation back to him. See, when everything is going good, then and Congress sings, God bless America on 9-11, didn't mean much. Right after the towers came down, that first day that Congress saying, God bless America on 9-11, it meant something. Why? Because America was on its knees. We didn't know what was fixing to happen in the world. But that's no longer the case. America now thinks it can solve its own problems. And so when there's pestilence, and, and, and that's the same way in our lives. Sometimes God allows problems in our life for one purpose and one purpose only, to bring us to our knees, to get our heart focused on Him. If you really think back and you're really honest, you and you examine your Christian life, me too, I'll do the same thing, I've always grown closer to God in trouble than in blessing. If that's true in your life, just raise your hands up. Yeah, we got little T-Rex hands going up. Yeah, I see. Uh, it's true. That's why I think, really, to be honest with you, I've had, I have people all the time say, Brother Don, why does God let problems in my life? God lets problems in our life to bring us into a right relationship with Him, a close relationship with Him. And we come out, even though we go through the problem, we come out at a higher elevation in our relationship. But, by the way, the Christian life is, a, is stair steps. We go through life, things are fairly normal, we have problems, we get close to Jesus, we advance in our relationship with Christ. Problems, we advance in our relationship with Christ. Problems, advance in our relationship with Christ. I was never probably as close to Jesus as I was for the four years that my father had cancer when I was really just a young man. I was 23 and he died when I was 27. I was never as close to the Lord probably as I was during that time because I was just overwhelmed in life. Life had just overwhelmed me. And then when he died, I just, uh, you know, I just you know, lost it periodically for, for a little short, short period of time. But I realize now, looking back, those many years ago, 37 years ago, I realize now, looking back, that God did it and allowed those things to happen to draw me closer to him. So, listen to what God says that we need to do as his people to bring revival to our nation. <clears throat> 
to my people, verse 14, to my people. Are we the people of God, yes or no? Tell me. What? Yes, we are. To my people who are called by my name, are we called by the name of Christ? Yes. <coughs> Shall humble themselves, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. <coughs> so you see, if we want America to be healed, if you want America to be healed, say amen. Well, the ball is in our court. The people that need to be healed, <coughs> they don't know that they need to be healed. A lot of them walk in darkness. But we don't walk in darkness. We walk in light. We walk in the truth. We walk in the way of Christ. We know the way things should be because the truth is in us. The light of the gospel of Christ is in us. The knowledge of God is in us. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within us. We have the mind of Christ. All the things are in us. So here's what God says his people must do in order to bring revival in the land. Number one, we must humble ourselves. And what that means is, is that we must make sure that Jesus is the Lord of our, of our lives. And that means Jesus is in charge and we're not. Is Jesus in charge of my life? Is Jesus in charge of your life? When Christ is in charge of our life, then he calls the shots. He determines where we work. He determines who we marry. He determines if we buy that car. He determines what city we live in. He determines what church we go to. He determines all of those things if he is our Lord. Because by the very nature of the word, he is the Lord and we are his servant. And so we have to acknowledge that before we can go to the next step. The next step is to pray to God for the healing of our nation. I was listening to a pretty good, I was listening to Jensen Franklin this morning. I listened to about three or four preachers every Sunday morning. And I was listening to him this morning, and he was stating that in prayer, the most important thing in prayer is to have a place of prayer. And I agree with that. Now, you can pray anywhere. You can pray in your truck, and if you rode with me, you'd do a lot of praying if you rode with me in my truck. But you can pray anywhere. But we need that place of prayer that becomes kind of like, like Abraham's Bethel that is special. Do you have that special place of prayer? That's where you really get serious with God is in your place of prayer. Uh, the next thing God says that we have to do as his people, we have to seek God's face. When's the last time that you sought God's face? What does that mean? That means you sought God. You say, God, I want to hear from you, and I'm not leaving this spot till you speak to me. God, I want to hear from you. And you constantly seek God's face until he responds. God has promised he will respond. But we have to seek God's face. And I think that for the church today, that's one of the biggest things that we're not doing. We're not seeking God's face. And then number four, this is not written to the nation. This is written to the children of God. We have to turn from our wicked ways, which means we have to turn from our sin. Our nation will never turn from its sin until we as believers in Christ turn from our sin. Every major revival that has occurred over the last 300, 400 years has begun in the church. It always begins in the church. It always begins through prayer, always. If you look at the Welch Revival, if you look at the big revival up in New England before the Revolutionary War, if you look at the big revival before the Civil War, <clears throat> it always began in church. It always began in prayer. The big revival in New York City back in the early 50s when Billy Graham was there, it always begins with the church. It always begins in prayer. And it always begins with the church, not the world, not the nation, but the church being convicted of our sin. But you can't be saved and accept Jesus unless you're convicted of your sin. And you turn from your sin and you turn to Christ. That's repentance. But even once we're saved, we have to, on a regular basis, be convicted of our sin. Uh, to the point that we will turn away from our sin. 
And sometimes we get so lackadaisical in our relationship with God that it becomes difficult for him to convict us of our sin. Listen to me. When we're close to God, <coughs> we're right there with him. If we do the least little thing wrong, what happens? We're convicted of our sin immediately. But when we get kind of arm's length from God, anybody ever been arm's length from God other than just me? When we get arm's length from God, sometimes we're not so convicted of our sin. Sometimes we think maybe God winks at our sin. And that's when our culture begins to impact our relationship to God. See, our culture doesn't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear that they're sinners. They don't want to hear that they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They don't want to hear that. And that's the only message that we have for them. There is no other message. But we as believers in Christ, we have to deal with our own sin. Here in Daniel, over in uh, Daniel chapter 9, he prayed a great prayer to God when, when Israel was in, had been in captivity for 70 years. And he prayed a great prayer to God. And, as, and after the, he prayed this prayer, <clears throat> the angel Gabriel appeared to him and gave him the uh, seven, 70 week prophecy that's found in the book of uh, Daniel, chapter 9, after he prayed this prayer. But the main <clears throat> premise in his prayer was that he was a sinner. And that he prayed for, and, and this is the prophet Daniel who did a whole lot less wrong than I do, or, you, or that you do. And he prayed, he, he acknowledged before God that he was a sinner. He acknowledged his sin, he repented of his sin, and he asked God to forgive him of his sin, and then he asked God to forgive his nation. But he could not ask, the, listen now, listen now, if you're listening, say amen. He could not ask God to forgive his nation until he asked God to forgive himself. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe we see all the problems outside the church, and we don't see the problems in our own lives. And maybe that's why we're not impacting our society. Because the folks outside the church are just like us. They can see our problems more than their problems. And when they see all the, pro all the same problems in the church, they say, why do I need Jesus? Why do I need the church? Look, they got the same things going on that I got going on out here. Why do I need Christ? If the church sees an alcoholic Christian, I mean, if an alcoholic sees an alcoholic Christian, he's not going to go to that Christian for help. He's going to go to somebody that has overcome alcohol through victory in Jesus. Amen. He's going to go look for help from somebody that has been restored. And so we have to be convicted of our sin. We have to repent of our sin. We have to turn from that sin and turn back to Christ and get back close to Christ. So I don't know what you need to do with this sermon today. This sermon primarily was more for me than for you, I suspect. I've just been kind of a little overwhelmed by what I'm seeing all around us and a little overwhelmed by what I'm seeing on the news and this and that and the other. And there's so many different opinions about things. But the one thing that is absolutely true is that the way to heal the problems in our lives, the way to heal the problems in the church, and the way to heal the problems in America is to heal our hearts through a close relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, I thank you for the day, and I thank you, Lord, that you've given us the high and holy privilege of being your children. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us the chance to uh, speak to you, uh, given us the chance to come boldly before the throne of grace, where you can hear our petitions of prayer. I thank you, Lord, for the great promise that you've given us that uh, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. You've given us the great promise, Lord, that uh, you hear us even before we speak. You give us the promise, Lord, that you're interceding in our lives with things that we need even before we do it. You give us the promise, Lord, that no matter what's happening in our life, you're using it to work it out for our good. Lord, I just pray that you would forgive us for our sin. I pray that you would forgive us for those times that we hold you at arm's length. I pray that you would forgive us, Lord, for those times that we allow our culture to overcome us. I just pray, Lord, today that you would send us all out of here like Daniels, like prophets from the Bible, Lord Jesus, who are focused upon you, who are filled with your presence and filled with your power. Lord, I pray that you would do a mighty work through each one of us in this room, and I pray, Lord, that when that occurs, that we give you the glory. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we praise your holy name. And everybody said, Amen.